notion of education and assessment and learning and everything. I, I specialize in technology and in designing mostly simulations that are used in assessment, but the topic we're going to talk about next here, is there a role for evidence in the future of K-12 technology? Um, really that's the cornerstone. Evidence is the cornerstone of I think everything that we do. It touches upon everything and it's, it's the basis for how we proceed uh, at almost every stage of anything relating to education or assessment. And so today we've got a really interesting panel. Um, I think we're going to have a really lively discussion from multiple perspectives on this issue. And um, I guess we'll start it off. Our first presenter is Liz Albro. Um, she's with IES. And uh, she's got a very interesting background in the social sciences, psychology, cognition, communication. And um, I think she's going to talk about the importance, or at least from her perspective, the importance of blending science with practice. And I think that's one of the key uh, areas of focus for IES. So without further ado, Liz. Right here. Oh, There's excellent. A There's a big countdown. There's a screen. Oh, this is a little bit intimidating. If I'm looking at the green numbers, you all know that I'm not paying attention to what I'm supposed to say. So thank you so much. I'm so happy to be able to be here to be with this um, really interesting um, audience of folks. I know, I know some of you. I don't know all of you. I hope um, if any of you have questions about IES and the work that we do that you feel free to come up and talk to me, and I'll do my best to share what I know. Um, so my role at IES is that I oversee the teaching and learning division within the National Center for Education Research. So today what I want to talk to you about are just some of my ruminations, my thoughts on the role of evidence in education technology, both currently and where we think we might be going in the future. All right. So let's start, you know, I'm a scientist, that's what I do, so before we get into things I think we should define our terms. So. I want to start out and remind everyone, oops, I have to make this go. All right, I'm, I, th I don't know how to use this technology. That's how you know that I'm really not a technology person. Okay, so we've been asked to think about the future of evidence in education technology today, and for many of us, our first thought are the computers, the internet, all these cool apps we have on our phones. But I think it's important to remember that technology is more than that, and that technology has been part of human learning for centuries. Um, and to remember that technology includes the pen, the pencil, and yes, the purple crayon. So girly, I'll read Harold in the purple crayon wherever you are. I'm an early literacy person. I'm up for that. Um, and that the overhead projector was hailed in the 1960s as a tool that would transform classroom learning. Just so you guys know, I've got some actual quotes, which are great. Um, and that the classroom is indeed without walls, right? So you guys know now that you can take your four-year-old to dinner with you. You just give them an iPad and they're good to go. Um, and for teachers, right? The, I don't want us to forget about the teachers in this equation. That professional development often involves the use of web cameras as well as simultaneous work on computers. So you've got that nice social interaction with the web. So technology is big, but it's not just technology is the way I think we're thinking of it now, right? So we have to remember that when we're thinking forward. Okay, so now I've talked about technology. What about evidence? What counts as evidence? Um, is evidence something best understood as a trail of breadcrumbs or tracks on a snowy path that highlight for the teacher or for the technology what is happening when a learner is learning or interacting with a tool? Or is evidence best understood as the outcomes? right, the outcomes of learning. And I think that we need to think of it in both ways. Certainly within the space that I inhabit, I think that both of those pieces are important. So let's just think about some examples about what counts as evidence in, in education technology. Um, so, as a learning scientist and as a teacher, I know that I can learn from a correct answer, but I know that I can also learn from a partially correct answer right, from a student, and I can learn from a completely wrong answer. Um, but I think one of the, and I think that one of the benefits of, of technology is that it helps us actually use all three types of evidence that comes from outcomes, if you will, in ways that are perhaps uh, more efficient than when an individual teacher is trying to do this for 20 to 30 to 40 kids in a class. 
But it's also important to remember that evidence not only includes the outcomes, like as I said before, but it also includes things like the length of time that it takes to get an answer, right? So you can use that to figure out whether someone's gaming the system, right? That's evidence. But it can also help you know whether someone has mastered a concept in terms of the speed of time. Another thing that I think technology has the potential to really help us with, but in my interaction with folks who do technology, we don't necessarily know how to do this, is the path you took to get your answer, right? You guys all have tons of log data, but not everybody knows how to analyze that mountain, those mountains of log data to actually help us answer this question of how a learner got from point A to point B. And finally, where's my I wonder? So I thought you that our I wonder <laughs> speaker was actually going to talk about eye tracking. I was like, awesome. Um, <laughs> but one of the things as a reading researcher that for me is really, really exciting is that we can actually use visual, visual pathways and processes to help us understand what's going on when a kid who really struggles to read, what that child is at, what actions he or she is taking as they're trying to make sense of a text. OK. now. There's more, but that's just enough to start us out, OK? So let me talk a little bit about IES, because I would really be remiss in my role as a federal, uh, a federal officer if I did not actually share this with you. So I decided instead of doing an org chart, I would try something a little bit different. Um, how many of you know about the Institute of Education Sciences beyond what Russ just told you? <laughs> All right, so we've got a portion, about half of you all know us. So the Institute of Education Sciences is the research arm within the Department of Education. And we're composed of four centers, so normally you'd see four blocks. But let me just talk to you about the fact that we have actually, so I've got four centers, but we have five functions. We've got the research centers, which is this, oops, yeah, this corner here, which supports the National Center for Education Research, where I sit, and the National Center for Special Education Research, and where for those of you who are looking for research funding, you should come talk to me, because that's what we do. We generate evidence. We also have an evaluation group that works very closely with the department and works with the implementation of program dollars. And they generate uh, evidence as well, but it's about um, evidence of large funding streams or large programs. We also have the National Center for Education Statistics, which generates data, which underlies perhaps, and some people think of data as the same as evidence, and we might have a conversation about that. And then finally, we also have the Knowledge Utilization Center, which is where the, I mean, the Knowledge Utilization Component, which talks about the WWC, the Clearinghouse, the Practice Guide that Russ Schilling put out. So we have this information of taking what we're learning and sharing it out with the group. So IES has a lot, and I'm happy to talk more about it. What kind of R&D do we support? OK, so I've given you the frame. What do we talk about? And I was really glad that Russ showed you that graph of all of the, the STEM work that we support and that it's across all of these different program areas. That's true for education technology, too. So we have about 21 different program areas that we support across the two research centers. And there's edu education technology in every single one of those portfolios. And so what you, do when you, what you see when you look at that is we see technology as a supplement to classroom instruction. People are doing research around that. As a replacement for classroom instruction, right? That goes back to the Neil Stevenson. Let's, let's get rid of the teacher and put, the, put that in there. Um, we look at adaptive assessment, so that came up before as well. So if we have a student, students with um, special needs or students who are English learners, how do we leverage technology to make sure that we're actually assessing learning and not something else? Um, and then, of course, we support quite a bit of games and technologies to support learning outside of school. So what I want to do for the remainder of my time, with my big green numbers here that tell me how much time I have, is just highlight a very few examples. And I, if I offend someone here because I've not included your example, just know that it had to do with what picture I had handy. It's nothing to say about your work, OK? So what do we do? How do we use evidence to shape education technology? Um, what I want to, one of the reasons I wanted to do this with you today is to show how the work that we're currently supporting really, uh, I think, illustrates a point made elegantly by Brewer Saxberg in an Edwee column in the middle of April. Did any of you guys see this? Where he talked about the fact that we need learning sciences to lie behind technology, that that is part of what's going on, right? In order for us to actually make use of the tools that are technology, we've got to make sure that what we know about learning is embedded in those tools. So that's really what you're going to see. And I'm a cognitive scientist, so there you go. And this is how we make it be transformative. So we can use evidence to develop technology. So here's one example. Um, Phil Kelman 
is at the at, is at UCLA. UCLA, he is. Phil's at UCLA, and he's worked with Chris Massey, and he does work on perceptual psychology. Eleanor Gibson. This is like you know 60, 70 years ago, and essentially the human machine is a perceptual category matching human. Right? We use perception to create categories in the world, and yet. We don't, we have not always thought about how we can use technology to leverage that learning, that learning mechanism, right, that we know is how the brain works. So Phil and Chris Massey have created this tool and they did an SBIR a grant to create, the, to actually um, make this a program, a pro, blah, I can't even talk, make this a tool that's available widely where they said, look, part of learning math is not about learning how to solve problems, it's learning how to recognize what Pro, what a problem, need, uh, what you need to know about a problem in order, order to solve it. So they put kids through this process where they give them sets of four problems and they say, okay, what's an alternative way to say that first problem? Okay, I don't know if you guys can see it. Um, but it's an algebraic equation, right? So sometimes what happens is you see when you're in a math textbook, you're going to see only the same algebraic equation over and over again. And it's always represented the same way. So a kid goes to take a test, a, a, a math test, and all of a sudden, it's a different representation of that math problem. And kids will get stumped. It's not because they don't know how to solve the problem, it's because they can't recognize what problem they're trying to solve. So we can use pattern matching to help kids actually become much quicker at learning how to solve these kinds of problems. And we had a fraction example earlier too, and one of, um, one of the modules that they've created has been around fraction learning, and they see tremendous positive outcomes for kids on this. And kids are like, oh, now I get it. Right? And it's not about solving the problem. It's about recognizing what problem they're being asked to solve. Okay? Here's another example that comes out of more than a century's worth of work in cognitive science. So you guys all know that before you study for an exam, you should space practice as opposed to massing it. Right? This is a straightforward principle. Except that one of the questions that researchers have sort of struggled with is how do you know when to space it? Or how frequently do you space it? And uh, Hal Pashler, another California person, UCSD, um, did work supported through IES where he actually created an algorithm and said this is actually the function in terms of how much spacing you need to do. It turns out it depends upon how long you want to remember it for. So how do you take something like that and use it to power um, the practice that is embedded in a technology. Now I'm going to do something here that I don't normally do. I'm going to put out a commercial project and I don't have any idea if Duolingo has actually used Hal's algorithm, so that's just a complete disclaimer. Um, but, but as you see, Duolingo clearly has created an algorithm that they're using to underlie how frequently you get repetition, right? And, uh, how, how often you have to practice particular words when you're trying to learn a language. Does anyone use Duolingo here? You guys know it, right? So there's clearly something underlying it. What I don't know is whether what Duolingo is doing is actually drawing on the 100 years of cognitive research that actually has, has told us what the actual spacing is that we need. Okay. What else? The other thing that we can do, whoops, sorry, I've got to make sure I give my actual, that's the paper if anyone's interested in learning more about that algorithm. Um, another way that evidence and technology sit together is using evidence to support instruction. So I want to talk a little bit about teachers here. I feel sometimes when we talk about games and learning and technology, we forget about the teacher in the classroom. Um, <laughs> that's, you know, the teachers are really, really important and teachers are learners too. And we, and we can use technology to support teachers. This particular figure here, whoops. Oh, crap, now I, sorry. Um, <laughs> uh, learning Innovations, um, ATI, this is another, another program that's been developed to support literacy instruction. Um, and Gurley, I didn't know you were going to talk about literacy, but since that's what I do, that's what I think about. So Carol Connor, this comes out of work that was done 20 years ago where she went and observed literacy instruction in kindergarten classrooms and looked at good teachers and said, what are good teachers doing in literacy instruction? And what she was able to determine was that there was grouping strategies that were done. And teachers would gather knowledge, they would gather evidence about what these kids were doing, and she would act, the, the teacher would then shape instruction <coughs> so that the kids who needed phonics instruction got phonics instruction, and the kids who needed um, vocabulary instruction would receive that. But that's actually really hard to do for many, many teachers in the classroom. Not only do they not necessarily have the data they need, they may not have the expertise they need in order to figure out what teachers are, um, 
what students are, what students need what. And so she created an algorithm, again, here's like a place where we're using technology. She created an algorithm where she could take student data that was gathered in the fall semester and actually group kids in a classroom for a teacher, right, so that's what the different colors are, and say, okay, you need to provide this kid with 20 minutes of this type of instruction, this other kid with 30 minutes, and this kid with 10, and she would create groups for it. There's a reassessment process that happens, and A2I has been very, very successful at doing things like closing the achievement gap, right, in, in Florida where this has primarily been tested. It's really, really important because what, ha what it means is that the kids get the instruction that they actually need as opposed to every kid getting the same instruction. But it's individualized instruction, not that the computer is doing, right? The computer and the technology is a support to the teacher who implements that in the classroom. Um, another tool that's very like this is assessments, and I don't know if we have any assessments people here. Some of you all might have heard this at um, WPI, where they actually do this in the context of math, and it's homework, and it kind of pulls together principles of space practice and teachers, and it's a technological tool that helps support, um, support teachers and kids as they learn. All right, but then, and here's my Roadrunner picture. I, was, I figure we need a cartoon. Um, but one of the things that happens is sometimes technology and tools speed past what we know about learning, right? And we think that we, ha we have a lot of products out there right now that are called brain-based brain tools, right? You guys know a lot about this, right? Neuroscience is like going directly into learning. And a lot of that, a lot of that um, if you talk to a neuroscientist, they're gonna say, yeah, it's not really neuroscience that they're talking about. Maybe it's cognitive science. But so what do we do? How do we, as consumers and creators of technology, do a good job at making sure that we're not creating tools that are potentially harmful, right, or potentially counter? And I think what we do is we keep calm, we slow down. You guys will know I'm a real scientist is that we gather evidence, right? We've got to go back and figure out what do we know and how can we use it to transform the technology to make appropriate decisions. And fortunately, we've got researchers who are thinking about this. So I have a team, um, now this is actually not, was not done under our support, but Kathy Hirsch-Pasek and Roberta Golenkoff, we've supported some of their work. And they were, conf they were very concerned about the fact that there are, hmm, I think I want to say 80,000, okay, my PBS colleague is nodding at me, I've got the right number, 80,000 um, apps that are out there for preschoolers. There's a huge number of them, and the numbers are growing exponentially, right? But, but there's no, how does a parent choose? How do you figure out which one you want to use for your kid? Some of them are really, really bad, right? And some of them are really, really good. And some of them are just fun and shouldn't be used for learning. So what Kathy and Roberta did was they said, well, let's actually look at what evidence tells us about what we know about early learning, and then we can use that to try to help parents say, okay, I need to think about these four dimensions when I'm thinking about what tools or what apps I'm gonna put in front of my child, right? And again, what purpose there is for the kids. So we know kids learn better when they're active, right? Active learning is a big principle, and active learning doesn't only mean that you're up running around, but it also means that you're actually doing something. You're not just passively responding to material. Engagement is a critical part, again, for learners. How do you make sure that a tool, how do you know if a tool is engaging? It has to be meaningful. It has to be situated in context. And I think, again, these questions of social justice and thinking about sort of what's meaningful to what learner is another really important piece that we know less about. And apps and, and all technology has got to be embedded in this framework of social context, right? Three-year-olds learn best when there's a social interactive frame around what they do. And Sesame Street is a great example of a tool that promotes social interaction and shows it. But we know that some of the strongest results of Sesame Street come from when parents sit down with their kids and actually talk together about what's happening in Sesame Street, right? Or in shows. So now, as I'm looking at my time wind down, I think the next question for us, and I think that part of the purpose of this meeting is to think about where is evidence and technology going to take us next. And so let me just share with you a couple of things about what's going on at IES and where we're hoping it will take us. Um, so not only do we have our standing programs of research, um, but we recently, we are competing uh, the virtual learning laboratory. We competed it last year and did not make an award. We competed it this year. Um, the deadline is tomorrow. Um, but we have this idea of, so, so you guys can't apply unless you already have, because uh, there's not enough time. Um, but what do we hope to do with this virtual learning lab? Um, we really wanted to support a, an R&D center that would look at research on an evaluation 
integration of instructional practices, content, and learning tools provided to students, but within platforms that already existed, right? So the point here was not to create new platforms, but to le let's leverage all the stuff who talked about all the passwords teachers have, right? Teachers already have 12 passwords. Let's not create another password. But let's think about what can we do within frameworks we have. Um, and then to tackle this data mining question. I didn't talk about educational data mining in part because Ryan Baker's here and he'll talk about it and he can do a much better job than I can. Um, but, but data mining is a big piece of this. And there are a lot of open questions about how does all of the, the huge amounts of data that we get, um, how can it be used to address practical questions. All right, and so here are just some of the it, things that we threw out in the RFA um, that we wanted to look at instructional needs of learners across the whole spectrum, right? We don't, we wanna make sure we include students with disabilities um, and students who are advanced learners. We wanna look at retention over time, right? So this is the other hard part. We know that you can't, I'm gonna run out of time. We, <laughs> we know that, that what, you, what you remembered two minutes after you learned is often not the same thing as what you remember two weeks down the line or a month down the line or a year down the line. How can we use technology to help us tackle that? We wanna know what we can do to help to use technology to support questions of persistent, persistence and completion. And again, how do we support uh, the needs of low income and minority students and reduce achievement gaps? So these are the research questions. You guys can read them. You can read the RFA if you're curious and stay tuned and we'll tell you who wins. Um, there's other stuff coming out from IES. We have an education technology compendium that's actually gonna collect all of the work. You know, we've funded so far over 1,600 grants. We're trying to create a compendium so uh, someone like, folks like yourselves can see what we've supported so far. You can follow us on Twitter. Um, we try to put out announcements and, and highlight exciting things there. And I don't have to put this up because Russ already did it for me. You can learn about our SBIR program. We have been very, very, very pleased with the success of our SBIR awardees. Ed Metz is great. He's a great advocate. Um, I'm happy to, to try to share with you what we know about the program coming forward. And I hope we'll see applications from lots of you. And that's me. So thanks so much, everyone. And looking forward to talking to you.